Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Perry and our didactic topic today is uh, the role of sport, music, and art in uh, academics. And really uh, part of what I wanna talk about today is the rationale for integrating arts, music, and sport into the, the, the very matrix of the academic process. And I, I wanna give a little bit of a neurobiological rationale for why that's not only uh, a, a, a smart thing to do, but in some ways it's necessary if you wanna be successful. It's almost impossible to learn cognitive content without recruiting uh, other parts of your brain to, to be co-participants in the process of putting new information into your cortex. And so let's talk a little bit about that. And um, I'm gonna be, this is gonna be a combination of a, a kind of a neuroscience and uh, ethology presentation. So here's my, my um, trying to make this big, all right. So th this is sort of the, the topic. I, I know one of the things that's happening as part of this uh, pandemic process is that many, many, many people are talking about the opportunity that is presented uh, to kind of reinvent the way we've been doing business. And we've already heard from a number of people in the corporate world things that are looking at how they conducted business during this time and thinking about how that's going to change the way they move forward in their work. So for example, many uh, organizations are going to be more flexible about having some of the work you do being from home. Uh, there are going to be uh, uh, state organizations that fund mental health services, for example, that created temporary uh, funding exemptions for telehealth. Uh, I, I suspect that they're going to make some modifications to that, but I, I, now that they've seen that you can conduct really high quality uh, healthcare services, some, not all, using these distance technologies, they're going to be more willing to reimburse people for that. So I think that there are some positive things that will emerge from this. And one of the positive things, I hope, is that we use this time uh, as we struggle with how to get back into school, and we, that we kind of remind ourselves about what's important, about how people really do learn, how children learn, what's going to make them learn in, in an optimal way, and, and what parts of the old school structure we can consider uh, jettisoning. jettisoning. We, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff that we do that is biologically disrespectful. And I'm gonna sort of walk people through education a little bit and hopefully make the argument that uh, we really need to be more respectful of the arts, uh, more respectful of movement and rhythm and other things that are part of sport, performing arts and, and other creative arts and music certainly. So a smart guy, Leonardo da Vinci, right? <clears throat> I think most of you have probably heard all the stories about what a great scientist he was. The reality is he was also, as you know, an incredible artist. And um, this is true through almost all of, of the uh, ancient world. When you look at people who were philosophers, people who uh, did sort of invented math, uh, people who did all kinds of creative, traditional academic things, they also were, uh, it, it, what we even use the term Renaissance people. They painted and they performed with musical instruments and, and they did many things. And I think over the, you know, really over the centuries, we've lost sight of how important and really how central these things are to learning. So let me just remind you all <clears throat> of where we come from. And I'm going to start way, 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 way back, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations. And human beings 
the, for the 99.9% .9 of the time we've been on this planet, we've lived in these relatively small hunter-gatherer clans. And in the beginning of our history as a species, we carried the knowledge of our group, you know, where are good uh, places to catch fish? Where are good places for the hunt? Where do those really good berries grow? Where's water in, when you migrate across this dry plains? All of that information, it wasn't on Google. You couldn't like Google, you know, hey, where's the migration of the herds gonna go? You literally had to have some way to remember that. And the way we remember that was with our elders. <clears throat> As people grew up and they were young and strong and could run fast and be good hunters, they had been told where they would find these things that, the, the, that would help their clan stay alive. And they were told these things by people who had once been hunters who were now old people. And the skills about how to tan hides and how to identify certain uh, for, you know, uh, roots that had healing properties and which leaves made tea, which leaves were poison. All of that was in the brain of the, the elders who uh, were frequently the women. And so both the elders who were male and the elders who were female collectively had this incredible uh, amount of content in their heads about how to survive and they would pass this on to the next generation. And the major way in which we passed information from generation to generation to generation was in narrative and song. Now, the reason that we would tell stories, the reason that we used rhythmic narrative was that you can memorize more lines of cognitive content in rhythm than you can when it's non-rhythmic. And, and, and so the heritage, the oral heritage of transmission of cognitive content from generation to generation to generation to generation has been through mu music and movement in acting out the, these stories. And having certain cultural vehicles for transmission of, of content, certain dances. And so when there were certain promoter positions where you would reenact what it was like, you know, on the hunt and somebody would reenact, they would be the deer and somebody would reenact, they'd be the hunter. There was movement. It was movement. It was, these were little plays. These were involved pattern, repetitive, rhythmic stuff. And it was the major route by which content got from the outside world into the heads of the next generation. And as, you know, the education evolved from that point forward, one of the things that was very, very um, important was that whenever somebody was being taught, the, the teaching style was very heavily relational. And you would have a tutor, or a tutor would have a few students, or a teacher might have four or five students. And, and the day would be divided into times when you focused on, literally, on reciting poetry. You uh, focused on doing a whole range of pattern, repetitive motor movements, and dance, uh, and uh, was just as important as reciting lines of uh, Ovid and, and, and being able to pull a bow and run very fast and wrestle. So sport and music and art were incorporated into the conventional curricular elements. And that's how people were taught. And now that's, that was teaching of basically the children of the wealthy would get a tutor and that tutor would come in and they would have a swordsman instructor and they would have a, um, you know, they would have somebody teach them poetry and they'd have somebody teach them philosophy 
and it, it, you can read anywhere about you know the the development of, of educational processes but it, the point I want to make is that nobody never in the history of humanity up until the recent past have we <clears throat> felt that sitting in a one-way uh, top-down uh, instructional instructional model was the way to learn things. Um, the, the the current model we have, where you have one person who teaches too many, and it's a typically a not very interactive. This is pretty new, and the reason it's new is that it's not effective. Um, very, very few people who had any sense about how to teach somebody something would have them sit for hours on end and get spoken to and talked to. But because they had different ratios and they had a different rhythm to their day, they incorporated movement and music. And uh, that was a very, you could learn multiple languages very quickly. You could learn how to play a musical instrument relatively quickly. You could learn how to do a variety of sports relatively quickly. And so by the time somebody was, you know, 18 years old, which is a, a young man at that point, you had a whole set of these competencies. But you, you were basically activating multiple parts of the brain at the same time as you did all of this stuff. And one of the key things that this style of teaching was able to uh, take advantage of was state-dependent functioning. And as we've talked about before, if you are dysregulated, you're gonna have a very hard time getting cognitive content from the outside world up through these bottom and central parts of your brain to finally get up into the cortex to make a significant change. And one of the most amazing and powerful and important things about uh, the organization of the human brain is that these core regulatory networks right here that basically control how open your cortex is for cognitive content. These systems are exquisitely sensitive to music, movement, and relational interaction, all three of which are at, at the core of sport, performing arts, and, and something that we really have, unfortunately, in the modern educational system been quite disrespectful of. <clears throat> so part of what uh, we've, you know, we, I think everybody who's been uh, a part of this um, system, a part of learning a little bit about our uh, approach has, has learned is that, you know, that the sequence of engagement where someone uh, recognizes that in order for you to teach somebody anything, you know, and again, remember, this is the cortex is the top of the brain. It's a part of the brain that stores symbolic information. It's a part of the brain that stores geography, history, math, reading, language, all of that stuff is allowed by systems in the cortex being organized, developed, maintained. And yet, the ability of the cortex to be fully functional and for somebody to have access to that is dependent upon somebody having a sense of relational safety. In turn, the sense of relational safety is dependent upon a minimal level of regulation. So if you want to get to the cortex, you have to make sure that the individual has a minimal level of regulation. And we've talked about this a lot in, in different parts of our neurosequential model teaching. The most efficient way, the most effective way to get up to the cortex is through a relationship. Relationally mediated content gets to the cortex more efficiently and more effectively than non-relationally mediated content. But 
whether it's relationally mediated or self-mediated, if you're trying to sort of teach yourself something, if you're trying to read, if you're trying to learn a cognitive concept without a person helping you in that moment, you have to be regulated. And so this sequence of engagement is something that is not frequently either understood or acted on in the conventional educational environment. The neurosequential model of education spends a tremendous amount of time teaching people about these core concepts, helping people understand that, you know, if you really want to help uh, kids uh, develop and, and learn a, a concept, uh, you need to, they need to have their cortex open for business. And so you can do your work kind of in these two domains of regulation. You know, you, you can do work with kids who are active alert and then they're calm enough to reflect. And then they come back out and there's an active alert and then they reflect on what they've learned. And so you leave, let me just bring this back. You leave, uh, here you are, you're active alert, you're taking in new content from the outside world and then you disengage a little bit, have that sort of partial dissociation, and then you process that information. Where does that fit with your worldview? And then you go back out, oh, he's showing a new slide. Let me pay attention to that new slide. You take it in, you see if that's something that I, it adds to my you know, knowledge base, and then you go back in and you reflect on, wow, what it, is that similar to something I've learned before? And, and, and then you have this, again, you come back out again and pay attention to what the person is saying, and then you go back in and reflect. And this iterative process of engage, uh, and internalize, bring in new content, disengage, process the content, sort it, figure out where to put it, is the bedrock of, of academic acquisition of new content. Um, unfortunately, as we've talked about before, the more you make somebody sit in a classroom and focus on you and pay attention to you, in the, in the beginning, they may be well regulated, but after a little bit of time, they're going to feel the need to regulate. And because you're not letting them move, you're not letting them use bottom-up regulatory routes. You know, these kids would sway, they go back and forth, or they wiggle their leg, or they chew their thing, or, or they want to get up and walk but we don't want them to do any of that stuff. And so what we're forcing them to do, we force them to use dissociation as their primary mode of self-regulation when we don't let them move. So remember, what are the three mechanisms, the three routes to self-regulation? Number one, bottom up, pattern, repetitive, rhythmic stuff. Number two, top down, which is great if you've got a fully organized cortex, your cortex is online, and your cortex is mature. But you're not, you, that's not kids. Kids don't have a mature cortex. Kids are not online all the time. And, and so that's a big ask for them to top down regulate themselves so that they can actually learn new content. And then the third route is that in the absence of some, sort of cognitive top, top down executive functioning regulation or bottom up somatosensory regulation, we're forced to dissociate. So these kids will sit and they'll stare at the teacher as if they're learning, but they're really tuning you out. And so part of what we do in the modern education system, because we do not incorporate movement and rhythm and music, is that we shoot ourselves in the foot. And we have a bunch of kids who are basically partially tuned out and we're teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching. And, teaching. and we're frustrated that, you know, only 10% of the content that we tried to shove down their throats gets up into the cortex in an effective way. But if you let this kid move, if you let the child stand and walk while they're learning, or if you let them, if you introduce the cognitive content in rhythm, if, or if you introduce the cognitive content in context of a, dyadic, regulatory, rhythmic, relational interaction. Somebody who is attuned, who could go, oh, he's not getting this. Let me give you another example. Get it? And, and you can see in the way they respond back to you, oh, you get it now, now you understand. 
So what would happen if A, B, and C? And as you see them struggle with it and then give you an answer, you recognize they got it. But see, if you don't have that relational attuned interaction to replicate that rhythmic, relationally safe stuff, teachers can go on and on and on and on because they'll ask a question. Anybody have, anybody answer, you know, everybody get it? Well, if you got 30% of your class, it's dissociated. They're not even going to hear you ask if you got it. And if you confront the student, they're going to give you that dissociative compliant, uh, yeah, and you're going to think you taught it and you're going to move on. And again, this is, that would happen much less frequently if we used music and art and sport and yoked those things with our academic teaching process. And, I, and there are ways to do it. And, you know, a lot of the, there's a lot of very creative ways to do this. And we've heard from many of our colleagues in the neurosequential network uh, ways that they have done this. And I, I just hope that people begin to think about <clears throat> how do we actually understand the dosing and, and spacing challenges of education? How do we create an, a developmental set of experiences uh, that are going to allow children opportunities for getting content into their cortex, but also reflecting on that content? As you heard from Christy Brandt in her wonderful presentation about reflective supervision, the truth is you can get stuff up here and get it into the I learned that box but it basically is not contextualized and you really didn't learn until you've had a chance to reflect on it. And of course, in the educational system, <clears throat> we don't give kids time to reflect. We don't give them time to sort of think that through. We need to be much more intentional and we also need to recognize that one of the things, one of the most uh, powerful ways to kind of get to this reflective state is to step away from jamming cognitive content in your head and go for a walk or go play catch or go do something that's sport-like or art-like. And pretty soon, in the background of your consciousness, your brain will start to process where that stuff is. Again, I talked about this before, but if you have somebody any, any age, have them learn a cognitive concept, you introduce it to them for 10 minutes, and then you let them go walk on a treadmill for five minutes, they remember it better than if you don't let them do that. Pattern, repetitive movement, yoking, helps somebody get to the point where they can actually manipulate the content they've learned in a way that leads to true understanding and incorporation into the person's existing understanding of these of, of precursor concepts. In other words, movement, rhythm, relational, interactions, all of which are pretty impoverished in our current educational system, those three things are essential elements to effective acquisition of cognitive content and really should be at the absolute core of a successful and new educational system. And I hope you guys, those of you who are in the planning process, those of you uh, who are in systems, I'm sure you're gonna see all kinds of uh, decision-making that marginalizes the importance of sport, the importance of music, the importance of art, as everybody's going back and what they're gonna be concerned about is, is Billy gonna get his STEM content presented? Is Billy going to get, you know, is Sally going to have an opportunity, you know, to make sure that she is reading at this high level of expectation and they're going to push cognitive, cognitive, cognitive. And the reality is what they don't realize is that the harder they push, the slower they'll go. They, if you really want kids to have a full brain engagement, that allows them to learn things in an optimal way, 
you can just look at, for example, what music does to activate key parts of the brain involved in cognition. Um, both performing, you know, playing music and listening to music activates the brain in all kinds of ways that will facilitate the acquisition, the effective acquisition of new cognitive content. And there are similar studies that do the same thing with movement and, and, uh, and other studies that do the same thing with relationally mediated content. So the bottom line is we, we have data, we have scads of neuroscience data about how important relationships are for the acquisition of cognitive content, how important rhythm and music are for the acquisition of cognitive content, how important movement is for the acquisition of cognitive content. And when you look at, you know, we've already, we've got built in to our current public school systems, resilience building, stress reducing, at cognitive enriching programs that we, treat disrespectfully and we marginalize and and this is an opportunity to try and make some statements about that and to try and uh, centralize these activities and i hope that some of you take advantage of some of that and if you need more more academic uh, content or more references or things that to help you in that process when you try to make that argument in your school district uh, just contact us. We have a lot of uh, support materials that uh, can help you make your argument.